thanks for making the time for us to do this. Uh, you're very welcome. It's always fun to, to chat about stuff like this. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, a lot of this stuff is, is sort of taken out of uh, the book that you're writing, currently writing. And um, so we just wanted to um, kind of get some of your thoughts on some things. Um, I guess we'll start out with sort of what is the difference between a clinical neuroscientist and a neurologist? All right, well, they, it's a totally different starting point. Um, my background is uh, started with a master's and then a PhD in um, um, human development and uh, psychophysiology and then moved into neuropharmacology and neuroanatomy and cell biology. <clears throat> so with that starting point, everything else begins to, to, to look like a, uh, everything looks like a nail because I'm a hammer. So uh, when I started in clinical medicine, it was really easy for me to look at a patient and say, all right, well, this is what's going on in your head. This is the chemistry of your head. This is why the stroke is doing this in your head. And, uh, <clears throat> and I don't think uh, an MD is really trained that way. They, they don't start out thinking, what is the scientific basis for what I'm looking at? They're taught that way in med school. And, uh, but, but once you get out of those clinical years, those first two years of med school, you just, you're anxious to get in the clinic and pull out your stethoscope and listen to people. And uh, so you quit thinking about that. Uh, but if you've trained for almost, uh, what, seven years doing a master's and a PhD doing this and thinking like that, you, you can't escape it. So clinical neuroscience is, is, uh, is different from a neurologist in that regard. And I'll probably make a lot of my neurology friends mad, but, um, the drug companies are very um, are very heavy on marketing their new drug, their newest greatest drug. And I'll give you an example of of one: the the Alzheimer's drugs that they've used forever uh, work on uh, uh, the acetylcholine system in the brain, and they don't really do a heck of a lot. And and while the idea is great, uh, they, they don't really have a big impact. But they were very successful in marketing, and uh, and three cups of coffee would probably do the same thing because they fire up the same systems and a whole lot cheaper. Uh, another example is um, uh, the one for dizziness, and it even sounds like dizziness. So the doctor immediately thinks, "Oh, you're dizzy," so he writes a prescription for that dizzy drug, and they really don't think, "Oh, well, wait a minute, um, why is this guy dizzy?" We've got this uh, inner ear that's sending a signal to the brainstem in this particular location. The neurotransmitter in that system is GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So, and then it has to go to the olive and the nucleus in the brain, then up to the cerebellum to figure out which way to flex the muscle so that you stand up straight. So maybe we should just try something that would inhibit that would enhance the GABA system and uh, instead of something that's really more of an antihistamine. So thinking about what the problem is, thinking at the science behind it, is really what you're, what I, how I approach the medicine. And I think the profitable side of that is that the patient goes away with a medicine that's actually going to block a specific neurotransmitter that's probably most likely involved in this little circuit that I'm trying to control. And, and most of the time we win because you, a knowledge is where you found the answers. So the neurologist is going to get the drug and the patient may do fine, but maybe not. And I, I maybe add a whole different layer to it. Sounds like there's probably going to be a lot of um, experimenting on whether or not a drug is going to work in a particular person. Um, you know, they, you get like a drug rec, rep will come in and say, uh, this is indicated for this. So the neurologist has that 
on his mind and when he's treating a patient right. it's like will that work in this person and maybe i think of the the body as a, more of a chemistry it's not a one drug thing that fixes everything and uh, so you've got this symphony of everything interacting and you gotta okay so you know what makes up the violin section and maybe it's the inner ear and what makes up the the cello maybe that's the brain stem nuclei that i want to play with so I think uh, getting away from that idea that we're talking about a single drug that will fix strep throat. Well, penicillin works for strep, but there's a whole lot more involved in, in thinking it through. Because you hear a lot of things nowadays with uh, evidence-based medicine. And, um, and there, was a, there was an article on MedPage today, I think it was, about giving credence to observational, observational-based studies. Mm -hmm and how those have a lot of credence still today. And for some reason, there's not a lot of stock put into it. Right, that's true. Why? A really good question. I think there was a move to get away from, um, uh, it, it looks like the patient's getting better, and a move more toward, uh, uh, well, we really don't have any proof. We don't have any objective data for that. So everything moved, unfortunately, maybe too far into the scientific. I got to have a control study with a placebo group, and and uh, but that's not really the way we started medicine, you know. That, and I, I keep using that example uh, of you know when the in the eighteen hundreds when they were putting moldy bread on a cut when their kid got cut out in the barnyard and the wound would heal and all the green pus would go away. They, uh, they didn't have a, a, a organization that the government, the FDA or the CDC that had to control it and say, well, wait a minute, we don't have proof that it works. Take that bread off right now. And they didn't apply for a grant to study it for five years before they, no, they stuck it on there, it worked. They didn't know why it worked. You know, and uh, maybe a hundred years later, uh, in the 1920s, they figured out it was penicillin. Uh, these these spores, these moles, actually are antibiotics. Well, then of course that started the the whole research on antibiotics therapy, and uh, thank God they did. But it didn't start out with a double blind study. So everything starts with observation. I don't care what it is. You know, you, you observe that uh, you, know, you fly a kite with a key on the end and lightning strikes it and you got, you're whoa, electricity, what the heck? So it, it doesn't matter. Anything in science starts out with observation. It doesn't have to be exclusively uh, limited to a double-blind controlled trial. So that's, I think, a frustration for all of us docs who want to, or more of a clinical scientist that we so okay well you know uh, the GABA in the ear will stop the dizziness well okay well let's give it a whirl why don't we try it yeah the uh, I mean uh, there's certainly a place for the evidence-based stuff after you make the observation but everything starts with the observation exactly that is exactly right so <clears throat> even moving from observation to evidence-based You've done your own research. You've got several different compounds that you've, you've researched and components that you've looked at. You've read the research on what they could be doing and what they're showing in those evidence-based uh, research studies. For example, um, using something to increase mitochondrial output. So you see these things. They're writing about them. Why do you think it takes a long time for those studies, even when they're observational or, or, or evidence-based, to make it into clinical practice? Well, there's probably several reasons. Maybe I shouldn't go into all of them, but one of the reasons is that, to, first of all, every, every new proposal in medicine is immediately met with skepticism and, and cynicism and, and uh, if not rejection altogether. So that word antipathy I like because it's like, well, so it's not apathy. It's just all the way to antipathy that we're against it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, I can remember when uh, coenzyme Q10 uh, started coming into vogue. People started talking about CoQ10 and, and uh, oh, it's not. And I had, I had some uh, comments about um, 
Well, it's a lot like heparin, so these people are going to bleed out. Well, that shows profound ignorance, and you know maybe the molecule roughly is has a few side chains that looks like heparin that causes the the blood to anticoagulate, but it doesn't work that way. So they quit. They just put. In fact, they um, stop doctors from using it in the hospital, which was nuts because there were several studies out there that had indicated that if you crank up the coenzyme Q10 levels, you get the heart pumping better. And you have these, and so the ejection fraction, every time the heart beat, it pumped out more blood. Well, that's the perfect thing for congestive heart failure. And it just makes this mitochondria uh, energy better in each little heart muscle cell. So it's just cranking out energy like crazy. So, Everything about the science behind that was just sound as it could be. But to get the doctors to even listen to you is impossible. I do not understand that. And uh, so now, of course, things are a lot more open, but it's 25 years later, and now people are going, well, yeah, maybe CoQ10 might help some heart failure and kidney function. When well, it turns out, yes, it does all of those things, and brain function too. So... Uh, I I wish I knew why the attitude of the physicians is as it is and uh, why they don't utilize a lot of the things that have just a sound uh, scientific fundament, and I, I, I don't get it. Well, I think things like this, people like you going out there and, and, and making people aware of it, educating, I think the Internet, social media is doing a good job of, of pushing people to become their own advocates. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah and it d does take things a long time to seem to trickle into the conventional medicine, right? Mm -hmm. Because he, he, there's, there's so many studies that are going on around the world on, on different, in, different components or, or whatever and what they can do in certain things like the CoQ10, for ex example, mm -hmm. and how that increases the mitochondrial output because it's the gasoline that the little engine runs on. Right. So because it takes so long for the science to finally make its way into clinical medicine, um, that's, that's, that's really kind of a disservice to most people. Um, because, you know, you've stated in previous videos that you've done that uh, back in the 90s, the, the, the scientific community discovered that the brain can heal itself. Um, just like the rest of the body, uh, but why do you think American medicine has not capitalized on this finding in the past two decades that now we know? And is that because is it because they're still they can't figure out why it's the one molecule that they're trying to synthesize is not rebuilding brain? What it, what it, what do you think? Well, there's a lot of that. I mean, there's so many reasons. I mean, the, you could extrapolate that question. I mean, just in, in reverse, you just, well, why hasn't uh, the, the, the treatment for stroke not changed in 100 years? You know, they, and, uh, and it really has its basis in some scientists that got, got published back then that said the brain can't repair itself, for example, because it's the one organ in our body that can't make new cells. Well, okay, so everybody bought that. And finally, in the mid-90s, they discovered, lo and behold, we see something that look like stem cells, like we see in other organs and in the skin and in the muscle. I wonder if these are stem cells and can they become neurons? And so as the science began to progress and they, sure enough, these things are stem cells. And yes, they not only can mature into new brain cells, but into new insulation wrap around the nerve. And, and um, but even then, um, the doctors are still uh, thinking there's it, it, there's not anything we can do about this stroke. We're just going to see if it uh, maybe the cholesterol pill will help it. And, and we're still very much in that. But why didn't things change for 100 years? And why are we still partly stuck in that mode? Because now it's been t oh, more than 25 years. 
since we learned there were stem cells in the brain. And my job was, my, my personal assignment to myself was, I want to find out what makes these stem cells grow. What makes them morph into real brain cells? And uh, so from that point on, given my neuroscience background, I was very interested in finding things that are in our own bodies that in a young person would make those stem cells grow into brain cells. So maybe it would work in a disease state like a stroke or like Alzheimer's. Can I reverse the process or can I rein it in? And uh, so that's what I've been doing for the past uh, more than 25 years. I don't know why it hasn't called on. I don't know why it, uh, again, is met with uh, some resistance in the community. I guess they get very stuck in their own mode. Uh, and no one really wants to go forward into thinking things through and problem solving one at a time. It may be, too, that uh, people just can't wrap their mind around the fact that something that they could buy in the vitamin store uh, does something that that heavy like remyelination of, an, of a nerve um, you know and you've talked about progesterone doing that in your other videos and um, and DHEA and ha what that does in the hippocampus I mean this is stuff that you can find you can order it on Amazon and I think that um, a lot of physicians have a real hard time believing that something that's so readily available can have such a, a profound effect on somebody's brain. And not just brain, I mean the whole central nervous system, because this happens in legs and arms and, and, uh, and everything else. If you stop and think about it, uh, they're waiting for a drug mm -hmm. to come out from some pharmaceutical company that's, that's supposedly invested millions of dollars in coming up with this amazing chemical. But that pharmaceutical company is looking at exactly what I'm looking at. They're looking at how does the body fix it and how can I make something that will fix it as well, but I can patent it and I can make it private, but it may, it may make work better actually and faster than what the body would kind of sluggishly do, and that's great, uh, but the doctors get in that mode of waiting for the pharmaceutical, so they don't think, well, you know, I wonder CoQ10 really does crank out that mitochondrial energy and you know if i'm trying to morph this stem cell into a new neuron i want to fire it up as much as i can and and all the machinery so i'm going to throw coq10 in there and see if it will work well yes it will work and that's how we should be thinking instead of instead of waiting for someone else to give me a drug that to, to do it how does it work let's let's figure out well if that works there uh, it's harmless to throw CoQ10 into somebody, so why don't we try it? And uh, so that's that's my approach to everything, and I don't know why doctors are not willing to assume that the vitamin shop has stuff that the body uses also to repair itself. This is a great segue because you talked about you've had a revelation, you've, done the, you've seen the research of these things that are coming out in the 90s, you're currently practicing at this time, and now you're you're currently you've got your own practice. You're doing this. You're you're instituting your own method of neuroscience. So how do you how do you get from point A of being taught to be, think one way because the science says so, and then how do you educate yourself over the last three decades? Like what was your process to get to where you are now to get to your understanding, either through your own research or uh, through seeing patients? Well, I think it, it begins in a desire to fix somebody. So you have somebody come in and they have something bizarre and, uh, and all the other doctors kind of blow them off because it's not easily fixed and they can't fix it in 15 minutes. And that seems to be the move uh, in medicine to do, th do things quick and give the drug and prescription and move on. But to me, I'm thinking, well, nobody's going to fix this. Nobody has bothered to really think this through. And I like puzzles. So I'm, I'm thinking, well, okay. I'll, so I go home and, uh, you know, I eat dinner with my wife and we watch uh, some, <laughs> some show and the news. And then she goes to bed. So I get to read. And, and I will, and, you know, in the old days, I would have to go to the library. And 
have to dig out papers and books and in med searches. So now you can just sit on in the lounge chair and have some soft music going. You can just read about anything you want to read about. So you get some biochemistry or cell biology. So then you go, well, you know, God, you know that maybe that's the mechanism that that is 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 not working right in this patient. Maybe I can suppress this autoimmune thing by just suppressing this one cytokine. Maybe I can, and this will do that. So let's try that. So you begin to put it all together. So it begins though with thinking through a puzzle and seeing a patient that's really suffering and trying to figure uh, puzzle it out. How am I going to fix this? So got to get more information. I got more data in my head. I got to understand this better. The one really good thing about the internet is that you have your library <clears throat> in your house. <laughs> yes, it's true. In your, your lap. lap. In your yeah, lap. Yeah. Right. For all its fault. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you you deal a lot with brain injuries and concussions and neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and you've talked about this destructive sequence and how there's specific points in that destructive sequence that you know are coming. And it's a, it's a prescribed sequence of events that happen. So this destructive sequence, this neurologic destructive sequence, you've talked about how uh, it's similar in concussions, brain injuries, and even into things that are really scary, like neurologic uh, uh, degeneration. Um, so can you talk a little bit how this sequence is similar in all of those things? Well, if you stop and think about it, the body has this prescribed sequence for everything. Uh, in the brain, it's no different. So what happens when you first get an injury in the brain, let's, let's take a concussion as an example, or maybe a, a severe concussion. Mm -hmm. um, in that sequence, you have an interruption of cell membranes. So all these little millions of neurons in your head, billions of neurons in your head. Some of them got pounded and the membranes break open. So they secrete their little in, insides into the brain milieu. And uh, those are usually not welcome in the brain milieu. And uh, whether they're uh, free radicals like oxidants, they'll escape and they'll attack the membrane of the cell next to them. And pretty soon you got kind of this cascade of damage that progresses. And then from that, you have the release of these neurotoxins in the brain. When those cells are injured, you get these releases of the neurochemistry. And one of those chemicals is glutamate. When it's out in the brain milieu, it kills cells too. So now you got more cells dying off. So, so inside the cell, the cell membrane is basically the skin of the cell. Right. Um, all of that stuff's okay inside. Once it's in the bag, but right. But if it escapes because that, that balloon pops right. and that stuff interacts with the neighboring cell's balloon, that that makes it pop. It makes it pop. And now you're having this just ex ever-expanding atomic bomb of destruction going off. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And glutamate is one of those things that's fine inside the cell, but once it gets out into the space where you know, outside of the cell where all the little cells are floating, that, that, that presents a big problem. Exactly. And it's kind of like carrying your groceries out to the car. You know, it's okay as long as it's in the bag. You don't want the eggs to get out of the bag into onto the pavement. Yeah. So especially in South Texas, you <laughs> fried eggs. Yeah. And the and the, the third thing that happens is you get inflammation move in, and uh, those inflammatory cytokines. We've talked about inflammatory cytokines ad nauseum in the pandemic. You know, the cytokine storm. Well, that's exactly what happens after any kind of injury in the brain and in the skin too. You cut your skin, you cut your finger, it's going to get all red and that's inflammation coming in. You get the antioxidants and, and the, so the same thing happens inside the brain. So there's this prescribed thing that happens in, in any injury. So what are you going to do about that if somebody comes in with a concussion or a stroke or a brain bleed? And uh, the first thing you want to do is, okay, well, the first thing that happens is these free radicals come out. We got to scavenge those up. We got to bind them up. 
So you give antioxidants. The second thing that happens, okay, we've got these neurotransmitters. What, what stops these neurotoxic transmitters and blocks the receptors so they can't do any damage? So you figure that out. So there's lots of places in that sequence that you could intervene in, and you could stop the inflammation with different things also. So that's why thinking through the science is so beneficial. If you can stop this what process, whatever it is, you can rein in the damage. I had a patient one time that came in with a, with a huge stroke in the back of his head, a big occipital stroke, and he was in the emergency room. His family called me because uh, they're friends of mine, and so um, it was their grandfather. So I go to the ER, and it's a horribly busy ER, uh, and the doc's a friend of mine. He says, listen, I'm some completely swamp. Why don't you just take care of that guy? So I did. I went in there, and it was, it was before the hospitals would not use supplements. Now they're very reluctant to use supplements. But at the time, oh, this is great, so I can start all my supplements and the pharmacies over there and they're not under any restrictions for the administration yet so they're so yeah i can get coq10 i can get yeah, i got a bunch of them right there. here so so they're they so they load this guy up in the er with all his stuff and um so he's up in the in the room the next day and uh, and I go up to see him with the neurologist that uh, has not seen him yet so we walk in the room and and Physically, he was blind uh, in the ER. By the time he got to his room, uh, and it was a huge stroke, by the time he got to his room, he was able to see us, and I couldn't even believe it. I said, you, you can see me? Yeah, see, I can see us, Dr. Clark. And the neurologist comes in, and he'd already seen the MRI and had seen the size of this stroke, and uh, he's asking me. He's not believing the guy can see either, and he's... He said, well, uh, all right, tell me what's on the TV. And the, and, the, and the patient looks up and he goes, oh, yeah, it's that little bee that's selling that honey. It's fluttered. Uh-huh. And sure enough, it was that commercial. And, of course, the neurologist, I can't believe he's seeing this stuff, and the stroke is enormous. Uh, but the point of that story is if you know what's wrong <laughs> and you know where the problem lies and you rein it in right then and there and say, well, he's got a stroke, you know, he's going he's gonna to have a stroke. He's probably not going to be seen. He's going to be physically blind the rest of his life but then you're going to resign yourself to defeat no i mean there's stuff you do if you know what's going on then that's that's how i approached uh, anything in neuroscience yeah i think that a lot of people well certainly doctors i think they uh they they may know that the brain can heal itself but that they that that is just that the brain is going to heal itself there's no external influence that can be done and they can't find or they don't necessarily, maybe they don't know about the destructive sequence that happens in the brain. Uh, if they do, they don't, they don't uh, exploit the, the points at when they can affect a change. And uh, so they, they are, they, I think that uh, the, the brain can heal itself, but you know, it's just going to have to take time. You know, the guy's going to have to just wait it out. Maybe he can see again in the future. Um, and that's kind of the same thing with the concussion protocols that are in the high schools. You know, it's like rest. And eventually, you know, work back into the exertion and back into play. And, and if you start feeling those symptoms again, just start resting again. And there's no, there's nothing for them to really say, okay, well, we can do this here, this here, and this here. And that's going to stop a lot of this from ever happening down the line. These Brett, sounds like somebody needs to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing that he is, because this is a lot of information to download. Yeah but a lot of good information. And I think that you brought up something, something really important is, is uh, some of these doctors, they don't understand the destructive sequence and what goes on. And, um, and, and I think if, if this is the sequence that's taking place, not only in, in head injuries, but neurodegenerative diseases, mm-hmm. it feels like it should be something that's monitored, right? Like I, um, if, if, if this sequence continues, then, then the inflammation continues, they're, their, their, uh, the ability for them to heal doesn't, doesn't uh, it's, it's difficult for them to heal from their injury, whatever that might be. But I think it plays into the football things that we see nowadays, right? Because the big question is, and you had brought up football earlier, the question is, when are these kids safe to go back to playing? They suffer a head injury, 
and their parents are hoping for the best, but right. they've got people on the sideline that are trying to assess whether or not that dinger that that, that, that kid took is worth taking them out of the game. Um, and then after that, if it is bad enough for them to be taken out of the game, how long are they kept out of sports? Now you've got coaches and, 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 and invested people who, are, who want them to go back soon, but then you've got parents who are asking the question, well, how do I, how do I know that my son is ready to go back? So with the work that you've done, the, your understanding of the destructive sequence, and the different testing mechanisms that you've used, um, we are aware of CT scans, MRIs, those are the well-known ones. Yeah. Um, but we've also heard of this other one called EEG, which measures um, the electrical activity going on. So how are you using these different testing mechanisms or t t how are you using these different testing platforms to supplement your practice and, and what you're seeing? And it was a kind of a two part question. How should those be used in an individual who might be playing a sport and suffering from a concussion? Well, you play sports, right? In high school, and everybody gets gets some kind of dinger when, or a bell rung or whatever you want to call it. There's a thousand um, versions of that um, when you hit your head and uh, you kind of shake it off and you're dizzy for a while and some people worse than others. And... Uh, and everybody has a stro as a concussion protocol, right? I think uh, every hospital, major hospital facility in in the community has this is our protocol, and if we're going to put you on this protocol, and, and it always involves rest, <laughs> uh, fluids, uh, stay in a dark room for a while, and then gradually come out and and start advancing your physical uh, uh, exercise, and eventually you'll be fine. Uh, and of course, there's really no endpoint to that, except the patient says, well, I think I'm ready to go, well, I feel okay. Um, but there's no objective uh, science that says, well, okay, the brain has healed. And I think the, that's a huge uh, a lacking point in all athletics, whether it's high school, junior high, whether it's a cheerleader that uh, fell off the, she's the flyer and she hits the ground. Uh, but all of those are real deficiencies in our ability to treat the kids, but all the way up to professional sports because, uh, you know, we treat some of these guys that uh, have been, uh, I think, uh, was it Lim Barney? He was, uh, we were working with him, and he said, uh, how many head injuries have you had? He was, 12. I've been KO'd 12 times. Yeah, yeah, and he was very, he kept telling you that story, too. Over and over, yeah, yeah, over and over again. Parker told you I've been knocked out 12 times. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a beautiful man, a wonderful guy, but you know he's he's served his time uh, with the Detroit Lions, and he paid a price for that long term, and that's the problem with uh, with these brain injuries. They're they're not a one time thing. They they continue to do damage. So the idea is uh, the question is really uh, how do you know when the patient's healed and are the kids healed and ready to go back to play. And, uh, you, and most of the time they do find they go back to play because they want to get back in the game. The team wants them back. The coach is ready to have them back because they, they can't do without that running back for very long. And, and of course, the parents, they want to sit in the stands and watch the kid run down the field. So they're ready for him to go to a play. So there's a lot of pressure for the kid to go back to play. Um, Not even to mention college uh, oh, yeah. scouts, things like good. that. There's, so. there's people watching. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So... Um, what I do is, uh, uh, again, we go back to the destructive sequence and what happens inside the head. And the same thing happens in this mild concussion uh, from a bell rung in his head to, uh, that goes on in a big stroke. You have a, a disruption of the cell membranes, the bag explodes, the stuff leaks out, it kills other cells around there. And you want to know how big the damage is. and. Uh, and a lot of times the patients or the kids will get well as fast as you want them to. They can't watch any screens. 
because they get headaches. They can't go to a grocery store through the lights and the confusion, and they can't process all of that. They're dizzy. They're nauseated. Uh, they can't even remember their their locker uh, code on their lock for the locker at the school. So some of these kids uh, have a lot more trouble for a lot longer. So the parent takes them uh, to the neurologist. The neurologist, of course, there's not really a treatment for a concussion. So he's, uh, they parents want an MRI, they did an MRI. Of course, there's nothing in there because this damage is microscopic. You get the cell membranes. You're not going to see a cell membrane on the MRI. And you can't poke a hole in their heads and take some cells out and look. And, oh, these cells damaged. Well, they would be by the time you took them out. Yeah, at so, that point. Well, these are bad. <laughs> it's a bad cell. That's your problem. See your problem right problem, there. Here's your problem right there. <laughs> so, so uh, the, and the whole problem is... Uh, are these brain areas still connected? Are the wires still there? Um, are the roads still connecting the traffic back and forth to the different brain areas? And uh, you want to know that. And the MRI is not going to tell you that either. And that's why I really like the EEG exam. There's other expensive things like a spec exam, a functional MRI that, that cost out the wazoo, and they really don't show you the connections. But an EEG will show you because it's all about electricity. So you can record the electricity from this little helmet with the, the electrodes on it, and you can see, well, you know, these things, this, you know, these things are really, there's a lot of activity over here, and there's not so much out of, over here. And, and you begin to uh, watch over a period of maybe two or three of those until you finally get the electricity back in that area that's that's not sending the signals and you go okay well I think and not only that the kids tell me I feel great now I feel like I'm ready to go back so you couple that you corroborate his story with what you're seeing on the electrophysiology and then you know okay he's ready to go back you mean observational evidence observational evidence oh come full circle <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing well, I think it's interesting because you've got these these tests that are out there. Like the impact test is well known in the sports community as being kind of a standard for determining whether or not a kid is ready to go back to playing. But the the issue with an impact test is it's something that can be manipulated. You know how fast they respond to answering a question, um, being one of the main ones. And so, as they call it, you know, at the beginning of a year, if, if those kids are tested before the season starts, which a lot of these are, a lot of these kids are, they can sandbag the test. Yeah, game it. Game it. And then when they're actually a bit concussed, then their score doesn't seem so bad. Whereas with an EEG, you can't fake electricity. No. And it's as objective as you're going to get. Yeah. And that's, that's why this is a just the hands down the best way to know and uh, you can do that ahead of time too so you can do a preseason and some schools are doing these EEGs ahead of time one of this EEG um, technology is called WAVI and WAV with a little bitty I and uh, and they'll do these pre-screens a little laptop quickie helmet thing it's fast and they can get a baseline so if something does happen then you want to take the guys that are at the most risk the one that always get hit like the quarterback and the running back and this stuff and then if they get injured then you can redo that you can see wow well you know your voltage really did go down and this connectivity is, is gone we need to get it back so we're going to wait we're going to treat you with the things that we know happen with a brain injury we're going to give you the antioxidants and all the stuff that that we know to do to to scavenge the bad stuff and then we'll watch and when the voltage comes back then we'll know you're ready to get back and in, in the game again if you intervene in the process, in the, uh, in the destructive process earlier, can it stave off um, damage, potentially short and long term in that individual, and be what, what could be done on the sideline to maybe address that immediately? Yeah, and like mitigate a lot of the stuff that's going to come later that we already know is going to happen because you have this prescribed sequence. Mm -hmm. Like, is there something that you can do in this acute phase of right after you take the kid's helmet off mm -hmm. and say, all right, here, you know, instead of smelling salts, you know, let's do this, yeah. you know, and... Yeah, that's a, those are great questions because, yes, the answer is yes. You know, it's, I don't care, I don't care how bad the, the injury is at first. I know there is one because he's dizzy. 
I know something happened on the inside of his cranium. So the first thing you, you know, if the, you know the destructive sequences, you know the cell membranes are destroyed, some of them. And they're going to start cascading and expanding their damage to the cell next to them and next to them. So pretty soon you're going to have a, a, a pretty big accrual of damage. So the first step, again, is to stop that free radical uh, storm that's coming out of the of the cells, the, the broken bags of, of contents. we got to scavenge those up and, and, and neutralize them, just like you would take antioxidants like vitamin Cs and stuff. So you have an antioxidant protocol immediately because within seconds that happens after the injury. Those, those bags are broken. Those cell membranes are broken, and, and the damage starts within seconds. The neurotoxins get released just a few minutes later, and the damage just can and, and within a couple of hours you've got all this damage going crazy if you intervene in that first couple of hours you can really make a huge impact on the recovery time um, one of the examples uh, of that is a stroke patient comes into the emergency room and he comes in and uh, he's got kind of a numb tingly hand and arm and it's kind of feeling funny and it's not you know it's kind of weak and and uh, the doctor sees him and he says, uh, you know, we're going to scan your head. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I think you, you might have had a little TIA, which is a transient ischemic attack. So some part of the brain didn't get enough oxygen or blood flow for a few minutes. And, uh, and then, of course, then it opened back up and, and you're probably fine. So they sent him home and uh, within 24 hours, uh, now they're completely paralyzed on that side. They didn't really see anything on the scans initially because early on they just CAT scan and you can't see really any cell damage early on in a CAT scan, so they sent them home. But that's a classic example because initially there's just a small amount of damage. It just affects the arm a little bit. But as that damage area continues to expand, um, now you're starting to hit nerves and fibers that are controlling that entire side. So if you could stop it, when they come into the ER saying, I got this weak arm, because you know what the sequence is, then you ought to be able to stop it from progressing to the rest of the body. And that's exactly what you can do. I can tell you f from clinical experience that you can, you can put a stop to that early on. That's big. That's big. <laughs> That's real big. We are not helpless when it comes to neurologic injury. We have just been conditioned to think there's nothing we can do for this stroke. It must be cholesterol. Here, let's give you a statin drug. And, and that, that is so short-sighted. You know, haven't we learned something in 100 years? I think we, ho we know a whole lot more. So we ought to be using that in the ER right up front. So yes, even late in the game, uh, we, there are receptors in the brain, and that's the, one of my big areas of interest, is what can we drive in those receptors and those cell particles, uh, particularly the mitochondria in this receptor called a sigma-1 receptor. How can we fire that up to make the stem cell morph into a brain cell? or into a myelin sheath cell, and you can do that. And, and we can actually get quite specific in what we want to stimulate to, to morph into something. So even six years later, um, there's still stem cells out there. Well, that's pretty sweet. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's a, for considering all the damage that I've done, I've got, I've got a fighting chance, is what he's saying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're coming out with a book. Hmm. And um, a lot of this stuff is going to be in there, and along with the science. But I think the general public, and certainly the medical community, needs to see this. They need to know what's available, and um, and then also everybody else out there that worried about their dad that had a stroke, or their their mom that has early onset Alzheimer's or dementia, or Anything like that. You know, the, there, there's got to be something out there. And if there's just even a modicum of hope, and I think that your book will be a really great source of that for them. Yeah, That sounds good. I'd be happy to, to participate in another one.